welcome everyone. Thank you for lending your ears to tonight's presentation. <laughs> the first of many corny jokes. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me not to do it. They really shouldn't challenge me. <laughs> so welcome. I'm happy to have you all here to talk about one of my favorite topics. My adolescent crush, my favorite band growing up as a teenager in rural Illinois, the band Korn from Bakersfield, California. Revolutionary sound, still going strong over several decades, uh, revolutionizing their sound, adding new dimensions to metal music. Um, you may have actually heard of them, even if you're not familiar with them, because they've been involved in a variety of different film projects. How many of you have watched the film Queen of the Damned? <laughs> Vampire? <laughs> oh, I guess you didn't see my vampire talk a few years ago. Uh, anyway, um, Jonathan Davis, I don't know where the pointer is on this, he's the guy in the middle. He actually had a cameo in the film because he actually provided all the vocals for the main character, Lestat, and they provided a lot of music for that movie as well as other films. Um, doing a lot of great work, so who's with me to talk about corn? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could go on and on and on about um, Korn, the band, but I think you're all here for the actual real talk that was in the program guide, which is about the actual food, the uh, crop, Korn. So one of the things I've been approached and asked when I said I was going to talk about Korn was why? In fact, there were a couple people um, who were like, why Korn? I won't get into the real story of how this talk came to be. The person who inspired it is in the back, and if they would like to tell the story at the end of the talk, during the Q&A, they can. Um, but ultimately, the reason why we're talking about corn is because it's such an integral, prolific part of our everyday lives, although we may not actually realize it. So to get you kind of thinking about why corn, uh, I want you to start thinking of some common products, everyday products that you use or maybe are familiar with that either are corn based or have corn as one of the ingredients. And before we get into, before you start answering that, I know it is summer break for some of us. I know some of you might have children or yourselves going back to school. I know that oftentimes students are afraid to say anything in class. Please don't be afraid to say anything in class because I don't want to have you know, my first memory going back into the semester that this group couldn't say anything. So let's start off my new semester right in a less than a few, in a few weeks actually by speaking. So go ahead, tell me what corn is in. Corn liquor. Corn liquor. <laughs> Why is that is the first thing out of two gentlemen's mouths? That's a whole other talk about gender for another time. <laughs> Well, corn sweeteners are in a lot of products you buy. Yep, yep. I High might be addicted sugar. to them. What now? Yeah. High fructose corn syrup. Yep. <laughs> corn okay. oil. Corn, corn oil. oil. It's corn syrup. Corn, corn syrup. Meal. Corn meal. Corn meal. Anyone eat anything with corn Sweet today? Corn. Sweet corn. Sweet <laughs> corn. Anyone eat anything with corn today? Probably. Probably. Yeah, corn, corn chips. chips. I had tacos earlier. Actually, a taco salad because my taco shells broke apart. And I made sure to eat something with corn just so I could be like, yes, I ate something with corn for today's <laughs> talk. So picture here are just some of the many products that corn are, uh, is involved in and can be made into. And this is, again, just a small sampling. I tried to put as many as possible on there, um, and this is what I got. So from drywall, so that might explain why my dog ate a giant hole in the drywall a few weeks ago. She just wanted her corn. She wasn't having a panic attack over the storm and mm -hmm. locking herself in my home office. She just really was hungry. Mm -hmm. um, paper processing, various types of food. In fact, corn mm -hmm. makes up 6% of our daily caloric intake uh, for all humans across the globe. 60? 6%. Oh, yeah. Uh, household products. In fact, one of my favorite household products, the breeze, <laughs> uses corn as a neutralizer for odors. I was very surprised to see that. Wow. Um, various different teaching tools, such as the chalk I use when I am in a blackboard classroom. Um, there are clothing, so there's actually a brand of shoes that is made exclusively from corn. Um, and more. Corn is incredibly important to us today, just as it was important to people in the past. 
So in tonight's presentation, I'm going to delve deeper into the topic of corn, focusing on the origins of corn, following the historical trajectory of where what we knew in the past and what we know today about the origins of corn, and then the importance of corn in building and sustaining civilizations. Is ethanol up there? Pardon? Ethanol. Yeah, ethanol. Is it up there somewhere? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's actually the top one that's from the ethanol website. So when we talk about corn from an anthropological perspective, anthropology being the study of humans and archaeology is housed within anthropology being the study of people from the past and their cultures and their material cultural evidence, we actually refer to it not as corn but as maize. And that is actually the original name uh, for this specific pro product and that's the term I will be using throughout this presentation. Uh, although as we get closer to more modern day stuff, I will switch into corn versus maize. So, Maize is an annual cereal crop, and I stress that because how many of us grew up with our parents telling us to eat our vegetables and pointing at corn? <laughs> it's not a vegetable, it is a cereal crop, grass actually, uh, and it comes and it can grow in a variety of conditions and environments. It's characterized by having very long ears and starchy seeds or kernels. It comes in a variety of colors including white, purple, yellow, blue, red, multicolor and more and there are actually six different types of corn that are grown today um, the best type of corn in my humble opinion is sweet corn that corn that we're all probably very familiar with um, i like to grill it but um, you can have it in various different ways then there is dent corn this is the corn that is used in as feed corn or corn that you get in the can or in the frozen section um, that you buy in the grocery store Flint corn is that multicolored corn, also uh, popularly referred to as Indian corn. Um, and it's usually a decorative type of corn, although we do see it being used in certain types of um, food and drink. In fact, um, there is a distiller here in Missouri, Wood Hat, um, that is proudly making uh, various different types of whiskeys and bourbons, including Missouri bourbon that requires Missouri raised, Missouri grown corn. And he actually uses a variety of different colored corns, including the dent corn in any one of his drinks. And they do actually affect the flavor. Um, then there is waxy corn. This is corn gro grown largely in China and is characterized by its appearance and uh, kernel type, which is more very rice like. Uh, my second favorite type of corn is popcorn. That's stuff you might be eating at the movies or if you're like me, you like it so much it becomes your dinner. <laughs> you can't just stop at a couple handfuls. You gotta eat the whole bag and then make another one. <laughs> and then there's flower corn. This is grown throughout the Andes and used for corn flour. Corn is actually the most widely grown crop in the Americas and it outpaces the cultivation of various other grain crops globally. So where exactly did corn or maize come from? Throughout early scientific inquiry, scholars were very perplexed by the origins of corn, um, in, par in part largely because it's very different from other plant species, um, leading scientists to ponder where exactly did it come from? With other plant species, we can look back in the archeological record and very easily identify the descendant population or the ancestral population. Uh, we do that very easily with modern day wheat. You can look at emmer and einkorn, which when you look at emmer and einkorn, they're just miniature by it, miniaturized versions of modern day wheat. You do that with rice and other crops. You couldn't do that with corn, with maize. Um, so it was originally taxonomically classified and then its biological relationships to several other plant species determined. And then scholars went, no, that's not right and they redefined where it sat in the taxonomic classification, then it did another redetermination, another reassessment, so on and so forth. And it wasn't that early scholars were dumb. It wasn't anything like that. Again, it was because there was no clear ancestral uh, maze out there. So this left a lot of early scholars going, where exactly does this fit within the grand scheme of our taxonomic classifications? It's very similar to the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? But it's big, the big difference being we know that chickens and eggs are related. We also know eggs come from reptiles or uh, some marsupials, such as the platypus from down in Australia. They do lay eggs, for those of you who are not aware. Um, 
So we have that direct connection with the chicken and the egg, but we did not have a direct connection to the ancestor to maize. Um, so that left scholars really kind of perplexed for a number of years. Until the 1930s, when archaeologists started uh, making some headway on the origins of maize, uh, starting in 1938 with Paul Mangelsdorf and Robert Reeves, Reeves, who published the tripartite hypothesis. In their paper, they proposed that maize had a wild ancestor that was either yet to be discovered or had gone completely extinct, and therefore we would never discover it. And this ancestor was, would be found somewhere in South America, and this would eventually give way to modern maize. Um, they believe that early modern maize species bred uh, naturally with a wild grass known as Tripsacum, and through their union brought about Teosinte, another grass species. Now Teosinte does resemble uh, corn and maize, uh, but it's very, very slender and it has um, very, very hard uh, kernels, at most 12 kernels um, on it, and it's not edible, it's not very pretty, it looks very raggedy, it's not something you would necessarily go, hey, there's a connection here. Now, Mangeldorf and Reeves supported their tripartite hypothesis by taking modern maize and breeding it with tripsacum and saying, yes, they were able to produce viable offspring, um, produce their own daughter generation. And those daughter generations went on and without any sort of human intervention, bred and produced granddaughter generation. So they had created a whole new species and they said this was enough evidence to support their tripartite hypothesis. So less than a year later, George Beadle was a biology student and he came up with a competing hypothesis claiming that the morphological, meaning the shape differences between Teosinte and maize were not actually that different and didn't require a common ancestor. Instead, he claimed that Teosinte was the ancestor to maize and that it was through a very slow, deliberate, thousand year or more process that Teosinte was evolved or changed into uh, modern day maize. He coined this the Teosinte hypothesis, saying that the Teosinte gave rise to maize. Now to support his hypothesis, he actually took Mangle, Doris, and Reeves data evidence and said, hey, this also supports the notion that uh, Teosinte could have been the ancestor to maize because they're able to be bred um, and such. And the genetic similarities between the two uh, weren't that different. Um, but the big um, stickling, stickler point, the big sticking point was that this evolution, this change over time would have taken thousands of years. When we think about the agricultural revolution, the changeover from being a foraging, hunter-gathering lifestyle to uh, taking on agriculture, we use that term revolution and it conjures up these ideas that this was a quick, very uh, fast-paced change. So a lot of archaeologists weren't necessarily keen on thinking and supporting an idea that this was actually a slow thousand year process in certain areas of the world. Um, and it could have also been that George Beadle was a biologist and that he was also a student versus uh, Mangelsdorf and Reeves who were uh, archaeologists and PhDs. So ultimately, the scientific community rejected Beadle's ideas and they supported Mangelsdorf's and uh, Reeves' hypothesis, their tripartite hy hypothesis, um, and Beadle went on to pursue other academic pursuits in biology, and that left Mangelsdorf and Reeves to continue supporting and researching their hypothesis up until the 1960s. Now in the 60s, Mangelsdorf and Reeves' tripartite hypothesis began to lose steam, so to speak, for various reasons. Uh, the biggest was that geneticists started looking um, at early maize genetics. Paleogenetics was in its infancy at this time. Um, it's gotten a lot better, but they were making some pretty um, revolutionary, reaching some pretty revolutionary collection or conclusions uh, from collected archaeological samples. We actually had much larger archaeological samples of early maize as well. And they weren't actually finding any of this genetic evidence of a missing ancestor, the key to the tripartite hypothesis. We're like, there's, it's not there. We're missing a huge part of the three-part uh, ancestral uh, hypothesis. Also, Beadle at this time um, had retired from academics. He had a very fruitful career, and he decided for whatever reason that he was gonna go back and re-examine his 
uh, Teosinte hypothesis. And because he was retired, he dedicated all of his time to this and just published like mad uh, about his what his original idea was. And it took about 20 years, but eventually the tripartite hypothesis was bested by the Teosinte hypothesis. So today, through a collaborative effort of paleogenetics and archaeological studies uh, of both ancient and modern maize uh, varieties, we know that maize evolved uh, from a wild balsas teosinte around 9,000 years ago. And the first wave of domestication did not occur in South America, as Mangeldorf and Reeves believed, but instead occurred in the states of Michoacan, Guerrero, the Estado de Mexico, um, in the Balsas River drainage of uh, South Central Mexico. Now, Teosinte is actually a group of grass species, some of which are annual, meaning you have to replant them every year to get them to come back, or they're perennial, that you don't have to do anything, they come back on their own. Those are the types of plants I like. Um, and Teosinte is indigenous throughout Central America, just naturally occurring. It is a single stalked tall grass with typically no more than two rows, ro yeah, rows of very hard kernels, anywhere from five to six uh, seeds or kernels. It is not consumed today and it is not believed to have been consumed in the past uh, due to the hardness of the kernels. It's a very sickly, not very cute, appetizing plant. So I don't really blame anyone for not wanting to chow down on this. So how exactly do we know Teosinte gave rise to maize? Through uh, a couple different uh, avenues of research, the archeological evidence shows that the earliest dated uh, maize um, through ra using radiocarbon dating, which looks at uh, the radiocarbon um, proportion, radiocarbon 12, uh, 14 carbon isotopes, looks at that proportion. And it shows that the earliest come from the Balsas River drainage, but it also shows that the earliest uh, maize are tiny, very similar in size to that Teosinte. And over time, it started to get more robust and longer to being modern maize as we know it today. So by studying those morphological shape changes over time, we know that maize started out incredibly small, incredibly uh, thin, and then eventually grew out mm. and up um, to being the tall, fat ears of corn that we're used to today. Um, now, we don't particularly know uh, how and why indigenous populations in the past looked at Teosinte and some stories as um, discussed, written, chronicled in the Popol Vuh. They, the creation myth, or sorry, the creation story uh, chronicled all the different versions of humans that had come before the ancient Maya. And each one of them had been created through some sort of natural uh, product that the gods used to form them. And then through their errors of not pleasing the gods, they were destroyed. And according to the Popol Vuh, the ancient Maya and all modern humans were formed from corn. And in order to not befall the same um, situations as their predecessors, the Maya actually practiced artificial cranial modification, the purposeful reshaping of the skull to elongate the natural form of the skull to look like maize. And that was their way of keeping the gods happy so the gods did not strike them down and have something horrible happen to them. <laughs> also, the uh, Maya um, actually dedicated two gods to maize. Uh, one was a young maize god, pictured here, and one was an old maize god, representing the more mature, ripened version. So corn was incredibly important. Maize was incredibly important to the Maya um, for various different, in various different ways. And then we have uh, chicha, which is, a, which is a fermented corn beverage uh, that was important to various different Andean societies throughout um, prehistory. Um, it was used principally for ritual uh, purposes. It was a ritual drink. It was not consumed specifically to get drunk. That was not the purpose of it. It was actually meant to be consumed over several days and nights during specific rituals, be it funerary rituals, uh, pictured here in the Guaman Puma, um, annual celebrations, sacrifices, etc. Um, and what's interesting is that each cultural group had very specific types of vessels dedicated to the consumption of chicha. 
Um, and these vessels give us insights from an archaeological perspective about the daily lives of these people, and it also gives us insights into the socioeconomic status differences of these people, of the people. Um, so pictured here are two vessels from the ancient Inca. The one on the left is made from clay. The one on the right is made from gold. <clears throat> you can probably guess that um, the not so rich individuals drank out of the clay vessel versus the rich who drank out of the gold vessel. But also what's interesting on this, in the picture on the left, this vessel demonstrates this very um, characteristic Inca vessel that was used to carry chicha and other uh, drinks, but largely chicha that's on the individual's back. So we can get some insights into everyday life um, through looking at these vessels. And then uh, this one is meant to represent uh, an important person uh, in the Inca society, hence why it's also made out of gold. Also what's interesting about chicha for the ancient Inca was that uh, the Inca emperors chose maidens to be the individuals responsible for brewing the ritual chicha. That was their only job. They were chosen and they spent their days brewing the chicha um, that the emperors and the uh, nobility drank for these ritual exploits. And this is also how they paid their mita, meaning their taxes, in the Inca society. Um, everyone had to pay taxes either in the form of producing something, such as textiles or chicha or um, building things, or they did labor. So these young women. Um, did their Mita service, both with labor and with products. Chicha still is uh, brewed today in South America, um, sometimes with traditional methods, sometimes um, with more modernized methods. I have tasted chicha, because again, in the spirit of tasting anything once or trying anything once, I did it. It wasn't my personal favorite, uh, but I also drank chicha that was uh, modernized. It wasn't made in the traditional um, ways. Patrick McGovern out of uh, Pennsylvania has teamed up with Dog Head Fish Brewery in Pennsylvania, and they've actually spent their days, because uh, Patrick McGovern is a archaeochemist who studied wine and ancient ales, and he actually uh, rediscovered through the archaeochemistry how ancient chicha was uh, brewed, and they've recreated it out at the Dog Head Fish uh, Brewery. So if you're ever in Pennsylvania, <laughs> Or when I finally get out to Pennsylvania to visit my friends, that is on my list of places to go. Even in our own American history, corn, uh, corn has been very important, either serving as uh, a young child's first and or only doll, as corn husk dolls were very prevalent, or the use of corn cobs uh, as the first <laughs> or only option for toilet paper. This may have been good information to have last year when we had a toilet paper shortage. <laughs> <laughs> and fun fact, um, I did know about this, but I didn't try this. But fun fact, people who uh, were used to using corn cobs when commercial toilet paper became more readily available refused to use it because they swore corn cobs were better at cleaning the dairy air. <laughs> this is another one of those I will not try once. <laughs> have limits. <laughs> Corn flakes. Corn flakes were created by John Harvey uh, Kellogg, who was a physician out of Battle Creek, Michigan, who invented cornflakes specifically to be very bland, to cure a variety of morally deviant behaviors. So he marketed this as the medicine for any sort of um, morally corrupt behavior that was associated uh, with being then medically um, uh, medically able to be cured, and that's why we have cornflakes. <laughs> that was in the 19th century. In the 20th century, people started to realize these morally deviant behaviors don't have a medical aspect to them; they can't be cured. They're you know social problem. Uh -huh. So the Kellogg uh, cereal company was like, "Oh, but we have this product that's kind of bad. We need to remarket it." So they actually, uh, this is where we get breakfast cereal as being the most important nutritious part of our day. They remarketed um, cornflakes as a very nutritious, important part of your everyday meal that you should eat every breakfast. <laughs> and then they realized that people like sugar and they made frosted flakes. <laughs> and of course we cannot forget the state uh, <laughs> states and uh, schools that are very dedicated to uh, corn, Nebraska corn huskers. In fact, when I started doing my research, 
Um, Nebraska and Iowa came up a lot. <laughs> and they're very, very proud of their corn. So of course we uh, have to remember them as well. So thank you for uh, listening. And I hope that the kernels of knowledge I have provided you have uh, enriched you as much as the crop itself with the nutritional brain value. Um, and at this time, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I had to step out for a minute, but is corn grown in Asia too? Mm -hmm. Where did we get the word corn? Why did we stop calling it maize? I'm not completely sure. Um, that I did not encounter in my research, but I do know that a lot of indigenous names have usually been rejected, and then more European names being used as a way of kind of appropriating it, saying it's now ours, and then using that as a way to then say, these indigenous populations are uncivilized and therefore need to be controlled. Mm -hmm. So we have a history of that, unfortunately, even today. So when did it get to Asia and Europe? Oh. After Columbus? Yes, yes, that was part of the uh, Colombian exchange. So that's when we started getting tobacco, we got chocolate, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes. So, as many people, are yeah. American? yes, they're actually Andean. So a lot of people are like, potatoes come from Idaho, and I'm like, no, mm -hmm. they come from the Andes. And they have hundreds, if not, I think at one point they had thousands of varieties of potatoes, uh, but because they were not selected for to continue to be grown after the Europeans came, um, a lot of them have gone extinct. And the same with cotton, we actually had a lot more varieties of cotton. And there's been a day because again, it makes up 6% of our daily uh, caloric intake. It's something that we need. Um, so we need to be able to make sure it can survive. And it's not just about our food calories, it's also about all the other products we use. And because it's so important to our daily diets, making it more nutritious is also really important because 6% uh, is the average, but there are populations out there where it's more than 6%, both in the past and today. So making it a more nutritious product is also incredibly important. So aside from this glorious, uh, information, these great kernels of knowledge I've been so far dropping on you. Uh, I already, um, I want to talk more about the socio-cultural importance of this crop, particularly in the rise of state level societies throughout the Americas. Large scale maize agriculture is credited with not only allowing but initiating the rise of chiefdom and state level societies such as the ancient Maya, the ancient Aztec, <coughs> the chiefdom of Cahokia. How many of you have been to Cokia or have heard of Cokia? Is that in Illinois? Yeah, it's in Illinois, just across the Mississippi River. It's a vast um, chiefdom level society. It doesn't look like much today because unfortunately a lot of the um, full chiefdom um, levels of settlements have been destroyed uh, through modernization, building of roads, other things. In fact, there's a highway that goes through one of the mounds, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> Cokia had a great deal of influence throughout North America. Uh, we know that they had trade networks all the way up to modern day north, uh, southern Quebec and modern day northern Mexico. Um, shameless plug, Cahokia is currently a state uh, site in Illinois and they are actually petitioning for it to become a national park. It is 20 minutes from St. Louis. It would greatly benefit our Missouri economy if this became a national park because do people go to national parks just simply to go to national parks? So uh, if you're interested in helping Missouri co um, economy or just you know helping elevate this to a national park, please contact your local representatives at the federal level and ask them to sign off on the bill to make this a federal or national park. Um, also the ancestral Puebloans were very uh, dependent on maize. Uh, you may actually be more familiar with them as being called the Anasazi. Uh, which is actually a ethnic slur. They don't uh, want that term used and I'm only using it in the context of making that connection and then educating you on it. Uh, these were the cliff, cliff dwelling uh, groups throughout the American Southwest. Um, when they were there, it was a much more tropical environment. There were a lot more uh, water resources and they were able to grow maize um, at, in abundance to maintain their large um, populations as well as populations throughout Peru, Ecuador, and um, Brazil. This is just a few of the societies that were dependent on maize throughout uh, pre-Columbian um, New World societies. Uh, I could go on and on and on about
about the other ones, but we would probably be here until Friday. <laughs> I have other things to do. I'm sure you guys have other things to do. If you want to learn more, you can come take a class at Lincoln University because I do talk about this in several of my classes, so feel free to take those classes. Um, but ultimately, this highly nutritious crop um, sustained large-scale populations, thereby enabling the great population growth required for chiefdom and state-level societies and the large-scale monumental architecture that we associate with them and the social complexity that are required for these socio-political units. Ultimately, large populations are keys to successful chiefdom and state-level society development and continuity. Um, and one of the key aspects of having a large population is you must keep them happy. One of the best ways to keep a population happy is feeding them. In fact, we know that one of the reasons that large-scale societies collapse is because people go hungry. That's one of the many reasons. And I don't know about you, uh, but I'm sure we all know somebody who gets hangry. <laughs> There's that phrase. Anyone who knows me at all knows that I go from pleasant Dr. Boston to Mrs. Hyde very quickly when I'm hangry. People kind of see it in my eyes. They're like, give her a Snickers with that high fructose corn syrup. Give her something. <laughs> so um, keeping those populations uh, fed was very easily done with maize. It's a very versatile crop that is nutritious um, and it can be cooked in a variety of different ways. How many of us have ever been stuck eating the same thing over and over and over again? <laughs> I was an undergrad, I was a graduate student, I was broke, I had a lot of ramen. <laughs> And there's actually a ramen cookbook, so you can dress it up in a variety of different ways. You didn't need a cookbook for maize, because you could grind it, you could boil it, you could fry it, you could do all sorts of things with it, so people wouldn't necessarily get bored with it. And more importantly, it could be stored for long periods of time, thereby feeding your population if you had poor harvests, if you had situations where your crops failed, or as much as people like to brag that they're successful hunters every single time they go out, reality is you're not going to come back every single time with food from that hunt or from that fishing expedition. So you always had maize as a backup. Also maize stalks and husk could be used for a variety of other products such as fuel uh, by burning them, uh, creating mats, baskets, clothing. Um, so. Ultimately, it was a very versatile crop that you could use for a variety of different purposes, and it was important as the backbone in allowing not only for societies to survive, but thrive. How many of you have heard the phrase, the three sisters? Yeah. Refers to the combination of corn, beans, and squash being grown specifically for the purposes of being a nutritious diet for indigenous populations. Uh, being the three dietary staples, providing the starch, the um, veggies, and the protein. What most people don't talk about, however, is the um, economic value, the agricultural value of the three sisters. Uh, corn and beans actually take out or put in different nutrients into the soil, thereby allowing them to have this symbiotic shared relationship where they could grow uh, quite um, perfectly together. Also, they had the added benefit of beans for those very early maize um, products that weren't necessarily very hardy and able to stand up on their own and help keep it up. And the corn uh, acted as a um, stilt, so to speak, to allow the beans to grow uh, tall and uh, hardy. But the squash actually acted as a natural barrier to weeds. Any gardeners in the room? Uh, how many of us love weeding? <laughs> Come to my house. <laughs> He's a champion. So squash acting as that natural weed barrier uh, really did reduce the amount of uh, human labor necessary to maintain those agricultural fields. Um, and again, the beans and corn working together and adding or taking nutrients um, and having that symbiotic relationship ultimately created this perfect situation where you had natural fertilizer and you had a natural uh, weed repellent. The same idea, the notion, the part of this notion is being um, adopted by our current uh, Lincoln University College of Ag faculty who are looking at uh, this idea of trying to find um, crops that will act as a natural weed barrier, thereby reducing the amount of time 
and money spent on herbicides, and also, if possible, adding nutrients to the soil, thereby reducing the cost related to fertilizers. So um, taking from that idea uh, of the Three Sisters and modernizing it for the benefit of modern farmers, because ultimately if you have a crop that you're growing that is acting as a weed barrier, you're saving money, you're saving time, and hopefully it's a crop or a product that you can also sell, therefore making more money in the process. Um, additionally, at least one uh, cultural group in the past, corn meant more than just being a type of food. It was part of their life ways. Uh, this was specifically for the ancient Maya, who according to their creation said, hey, let's grow this and manipulate it to something better. Again, it's not a very robust, not a very tasty looking plant. Um, I kind of look at it and I'm like, I know a lot of really, you know, picky people. So <laughs> Um, something must have occurred for them to go, let's do this, let's change this. And the best hypothesis that we have thus far is that there was some sort of mutation in a wild teosinte uh, plant or maybe a series of plants that made those kernels either softer or made the plant itself easier to manage for um, eating purposes. And that's why it was chosen specifically for horticultural practices. Did they grow it for their animals? No, we know that they were growing it for themselves. No, the animals ate other things. Now, originally maize was believed to have been largely domesticated in Mexico and then traveled, not by itself, it doesn't have legs, just has ears, um, <laughs> but traveled with people either trading across the New World or uh, resettling into new parts of um, the Americas um, and eventually made its way into Panama about 7,000 years ago. Peru 6,500 years ago, and North America 4,000 years ago. Now, the idea of a single domestication um, occurring over several generations in Mexico was long held believed. In fact, that was something I was taught in as an undergrad several decades ago. Uh, <coughs> I don't like telling my students my age, <laughs> so I don't want to give it away in this talk in case any of them catch it later. Um, but there's actually been some more recent evidence published in 2008 that uh, refutes this idea of a single domestication area. Um, it actually was based on genetic evidence of various different maize species, both in the past and today, and actually showed that there were several different intervals of domestication of maize throughout uh, all these different areas in North, Central, and South America. Um, so it appears that as people were taking maize with them, either as a trade option or um, as a new plant that they were going to grow in an area that they had just recently settled, it was a semi-domesticated, semi-wild variety. And then each of these areas, uh, starting in Panama, then in um, Bolivia and Peru, and then later in North America, they started doing their own domestication of it. And finally, it um, became fully domesticated through all of those individual processes in these different areas. Um, so this could explain uh, how and why corn is so versatile and being grown in a variety of different environments today and also could explain why we have at least six different types of uh, corn that is uh, grown today. Uh, the authors did not just rely on the genetic evidence though, they actually looked to uh, linguistic uh, evidence, historical linguistic evidence, and showed that by looking at the history of language change in these areas, that when maize, the word, was introduced to the language, that is also when the crop was introduced. So we have multiple lines of evidence, which we like in science, particularly in anthropology, to support this um, hypothesis. So what? This is a phrase that haunted me throughout graduate school because it was the phrase that my graduate advisor, supervisor, uh, repeatedly told not just me, but several of us graduate students, whenever we would come up to him and be like, we had the next greatest revolutionary idea in anthropology, we're awesome, we're great scholars. And then he would just deflate our egos and go, so what? I remember we all would have like walk away, downtrodden, and be like, oh man, we're dumb, we're idiots. Thinking that, you know, he just didn't want to listen or he thought our ideas were dumb, but it took me a long time to realize that that wasn't the case. He was actually challenging us to be better scholars by not just wanting to know something, but wanting to justify why that information needs to be known. This is incredibly important in any scientific or scholarly pursuit. It's not just about the knowledge, it's about why that particular piece of knowledge. What is the impact? Why should we know more about that? 
uh, particularly in anthropology, we, where we are publicly funded, meaning public dollars are going towards our research, we really need to justify to the general public why we're doing what we're doing. So with his spirit in mind, uh, he's still very much alive, but with the spirit of so what in mind, I want to get into, um, so what about this information? Why is this important? It shows us quite a bit of information about not just maize itself, but also about human ingenuity. So I'm going to break down all of my so what's, because it's not just one. Typically with Andrew, you needed more than one. Uh, so first, it tells us more about the evolution of maize slash corn. Um, it is a product that we as human beings are solely responsible for creating. It was not wildly created. It was not something that naturally occurred. We created it um, out of a need for a stable food source as humans transition from foraging based societies to agricultural um, societies. Which is interesting because when we look at the evolution and the changeover from foraging to agricultural subsistence strategies, we know that there were a lot of advantages to being foragers. It was actually healthier for people um, and it was also um, better for the environment. So we start getting into why did they change over from foraging based societies to agriculturally based one, particularly when they chose something that was not initially edible. It was sickly, it was gross, it wasn't, you know, tasty. So uh, we start getting into those questions with the evolution of maize. It also shows that the transition from foraging to agricultural subsistence strategies from wild to domesticated plants and animals was not as simple as originally thought. It was a very long, complicated process, uh, which archeological evidence shows not just for maize, but for various different uh, plant and animal domesticates. But this evidence shows it was even more complex um, than many people originally believed. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of the agricultural revolution, it was revolutionary, but it also took a long period of time to successfully do. It also demonstrates um, that this was an independent group effort because uh, maize was semi-domesticated when it was taken to all these different areas in the New World, uh, Central, North, and South America. Each group contributed to that final domestication. And they did so on their own. It wasn't like you know they had cell phones or social media or Snapchat or anything like that in the past. You know, they were in contact with each other, but it took several days or weeks to get in contact with each other. So it wasn't like they were like going, hey, I tried this and it worked out. They were able to do this completely on their own. And so they took something that was very small and inedible and made it far more robust and nutritious. This process demonstrates human ingenuity and creativity. Who and how exactly did someone look at Teo and Sente and say, I can eat that. I'm the type of person who will try anything once. I'm good not trying Teo Sente. Um, and thinking about this from a modern American perspective where we want the biggest, the juiciest, the most right at peak ripeness products out there, it's kind of baffling in some ways for, for individuals to recognize that these groups looked at that and said, we are going to change this. We're going to make this something different. Um, so I like to credit them as geniuses, as trailblazers, because they took something that wasn't edible and they invented a whole new crop that sustained them and continues to sustain us today. And in case that's not enough, for those of you who don't like history, it's okay, not no one's perfect. Uh, it offers us insights into how we can improve on this very important global crop staple, especially in understanding the genetics of maize, so we can develop new species that are better resistant to disease, uh, more adaptable to extreme environmental changes because we just had the uh, hottest June on record. We are seeing various different um, global environmental changes. Uh, I've got friends in the Pacific Northwest and uh, the fisheries are being decimated because of the heat and the lack of oxygen in the water because of the water temperatures getting too high. Corn is so important to us to push to bring them back because they're naturally different colored and they're actually more sustainable than the white cotton. Wow, cool. Because they don't lose their color and they're actually hardier. They actually are resistant to pests a lot better. Speaking of potatoes, um, with corn being such a staple crop for so many societies, has there ever been sort of like an Irish potato famine, sort of you 
that with corn and that impacted society? Um, yes and no. Um, when we have situations where there are drought and people weren't able to sustain those maize fields, such as the Anasazi, um, that was one of the contributing factors to the fall of that society as desert desertification took over and they started losing water and we see that throughout the American West, hence why it's so dry out there now and water is so expensive. Um, that was a contributing factor because they couldn't feed their population and that led to violence and interpersonal violence among the Anastasi and ultimately uh, that led to the fall of their societies. May have also been a contributing factor with the Maya as well, but not from desertification, but because they were def they were doing deforestation at a rapid rate that they couldn't sustain the soil. Thank you, Christine.